Now let's look at another early part of the process. There's the manufacture of the pipes and so on, but there's also the digging of the trench, the building of the foundations for the drainage lines. Yes, and this is a critical part of the process. Yeah, because we're dealing with varying site conditions. Yeah, the contract has to do the set out to match the details shown on the drawings for line and level. And at this point we have a whole point for the RTA site management team to inspect that set out. And it's really important that they do that because if it's wrong, this is the time to get it right. Now Dennis, something that we didn't see out on site because it wasn't an issue there was settlement. What do we need to consider there? A good question. Where embankments are constructed over soft soils, the control of settlement of pipelines is critical and it's essential that the design assumptions are shown on the drawings and that they are fully complied with. And that would include things like the support of the pipes? Yes, and the alternatives for pipe support include things like rock mattresses, or timber and other types of piles. So it's clearly not a case of just shoving in whatever's at hand. You really need to design these foundations properly. And obviously, Dennis, all these uh, methods have to be approved. They do, Peter, and various practices have evolved over time to handle thick layers of soft or wet materials under culverts. But rather than go into detail here, there is an RTA technical direction. Uh, which sets out a range of suitable treatments depending on the situation you're faced with. Well, I was looking forward to hearing a little bit more about rock mattresses, but I suppose all of this bedding comes immediately before the laying of the pipes, right? So we're at the point where the drainage system is marked out, the pipes and box culverts have been manufactured, the excavation has been done. We're at another hold point, Dennis? Well, what we actually have is called a witness point, and it's an opportunity when the foundations have been exposed for either embankment or trench construction and this is an opportunity for the RTA site management team to inspect those foundations and agree that they're acceptable. Okay. And we also have the whole point that you were mentioning which is an opportunity for the contractor to identify and propose the removal of any inadequate foundation material. Now to the untrained eye this just looks like a normal ditch, a trench, but, but Dennis there's more to it. You've, you've picked up something here. Yeah, what we're looking at here Peter is the uh foundation excavation for an embankment construction pipe culvert and this is the uh, upstream end we're looking at and what you can see here is see this this uh, black gooey looking stuff yeah that's uh, alluvium it's highly wet saturated it's pretty much rubbish material and obviously that would not be suitable for the foundation of a culvert right but what you can notice here is there's an interface between the black gooey stuff and then you get into a more gray coloured material yeah. and if you look down the bottom of the foundation now you can see it's quite a, it's actually quite a stiff clay yep. and that's suitable for foundation material. Right, so we need to cut down below the, the no good stuff into the good stuff before... Yeah, in, in this case we're lucky because when they've got down to the level they wanted to get at the material is in fact okay yep. but if it had been still of that, that black gooey nature yep. then we would have had to have gone down further till we'd removed all that and replaced it with good material. It is the RTA site management team's responsibility to confirm and direct the extent of the removal of what we call um, inadequate foundation material. And this can include not only the bottom of trenches, but also the sides of trenches. Uh, you use the word inadequate there. Now this is not to be confused with the word unsuitable, which is used in earthworks construction. It all sounds a little bit complicated, but is there a physical difference between the word unsuitable and inadequate or is it a situational difference? It really is just a situational difference. There's a pay item in R11 for the removal and replacement of inadequate foundation material in the floors of trenches. There's a similar pay item under R44, the RTA's earthwork specification for the removal and replacement of unsuitable material under embankments or in the floors of cuttings. And we just don't want to confuse the two situations so we use different terms. Yeah, not confusing at all, Dennis. Well, having said that, I think there is room for confusion when we're talking about removing and replacing significant quantities of uh, poor quality material from, say, the, a stream bed where we intend later to install a culvert and an embankment. Which pay item is relevant then? OK, glad we cleared that up. Before moving on from inadequate material, it's important to have thought through where the material will come from to replace the inadequate material. Mm. Will it come from elsewhere on the site or will it be imported? Now the expectation or the assumption of R11 is that, that it will come from elsewhere on the site, but this may not always be possible. And that brings us rather neatly onto backfilling. Dennis, a number of different stockpiles here. What's this one? This particular one, Peter, is the uh, stockpile of bedding material and a haunch material. Mm -hmm. um, 
So the specification requires us to have a stain size less than 19 millimetres and a plastic index less than 6. And this material would well and truly comply with that requirement. We're at the Bullet Dealer Bypass on the Mid-North Coast and Dennis, this is a great example of transverse drainage. Yeah, Peter, this is a very good example of transverse drainage. And what we've got here is pretty soft and gooey sort of material, um, which they've previously excavated. So we've, we've got here at the stage where they've already done the excavation for the foundation. And we've been told there's been some inadequate material here that's been previously excavated and replaced with good quality material. Then they put the foundation down and then they put the pipes in, laying the pipes from the, you know, the downstream side to the upstream side, which is the sort of practice that we recommend. And uh, following that, they've now placed, uh, they're at the stage now where they're put placing the side zone material. And there are all sorts of markings on the pipes, aren't there, Dennis, to describe exactly who they are and where they're supposed to go. Yeah, these, these markings here, Peter, are, there's a few here. There's a manufacturer's name. The top one is the weight of the pipe, which in this case is 2,500 kilograms, and that's just important from a lifting point of view. Yep. The most important ones are the pipe diameter here. This is a 1,050 millimetre diameter pipe. That's internally, right? That's internally. Yep. And uh, then you've got a class of pipe, and this is a class 4 pipe. Probably the most important thing to, to note here is that it's Im important, obviously, to make sure that you put the right class of pipe in the right situation. Yeah, so these, well. these things need to be checked and checked again. Bedding and backfill need to be placed and compacted in layers not exceeding 150 millimetres because we can generally only use small compaction equipment. And it's important that we do achieve this high standard of compaction, which in the case of the RTA is somewhere between 95 and 100% relative compaction, uh, depending on the zone and the type of culvert we're talking about. And Dennis, I noticed you said there for the RTA. Does that mean the RTA have higher than normal standards? Yes, Peter, the RTA standards for compaction are in fact higher than those required by the Australian standard and also our requirements for the material properties of the backfill are also stricter. So for RTA projects, it's no good just complying with the Australian standard. You have to raise your game and comply with the RTA compaction standards set out in R11. And that's why the testing frequency for things like grading and plasticity index and compaction are relatively high as well. What else do we need to look out for at this stage? We've got our pipes, they've been checked, they comply with the drawings. What now? If all the pipes are the specification, undamaged and designed... There's no breaks or cracks. Then we put down the bedding and lay the pipes. Now it's not a case of lying a whole trench of bedding then laying all the pipes. The bedding goes down just ahead of the pipe laying. That's right. The, the bedding is critical to the functionality of the whole culvert and it provides a uniform support to the pipes. The load carrying capacity of the whole thing depends on the uniform support provided by that bedding. That's why we've seen they take a great deal of care in making it even and level and even to the extent of, as we've seen, providing a little slot for the socket. And Dennis, the, the socket is placed uphill. I'd imagine that's to minimise slipping. Now, I'd imagine that alignment and grade are critical things in this part of the process. Absolutely, and what's important here is that the foundation is not compromised simply to achieve the grade. So there's no shortcuts like lifting one end or packing out the bedding to get the alignment right. You need to really take care here. OK, so your bedding needs to be installed, followed by your pipes, and then careful attention needs to be paid to the jointing of the pipes as they're installed. Moving on, let's talk about head walls. At both ends of pipe culverts we have head walls, and they are an important part of the structure. And an important part of the head wall is what we call the cutoff wall. And that is designed specifically to prevent what we call piping, which can be a cause of pipeline failures. Now, piping, isn't this what all these pipes are for? But I can tell by Dennis's voice there's more to it. The piping in the sense that I'm talking about it is when water runs outside the pipe itself in through the bedding. OK, so that's where the head wall comes in to prevent this. Yes, and for good practice, a head wall should definitely have a cut-off wall. Designed for what? To channel or funnel the, the water back into the pipe? The combination of the head wall and the cut-off wall is designed to channel the water into the pipe itself. But if the cut-off wall isn't deep enough, or, is, or even if it doesn't exist, we can have the situation where the water can find its way underneath the head wall and into the foundation or the backfill material and cause this problem that we call piping. That's not good. It isn't good, Peter, and also uh, head walls on the outlets of the pipes uh, without cut-off walls are also prone to undermining, and that can lead to expensive repairs. Mm. And as we saw on location, head walls come in all shapes and sizes. 
the head wall can be cast in situ, which is what we have here, Dennis. That's exactly right, Peter. What we have here, as you said, is a cast in situ head wall from a, from a pre-cast box culvert with a very large apron and as you, as you can see here the, uh, the cutoff wall extends for quite some distance below the apron level. But I suppose the important point here is by turning this wall down it helps prevent water seeping back from nature eroding all the foundations of the culvert. Yeah that's right Peter. Uh, this is a little bit deceptive here because the finished surface level of the stream bed is going to be up here at this level. So this area is all going to be backfilled later with uh, boulders and other material to bring the stream bed up to this level. But you can see that the cut, cut off wall is quite deep and its primary purpose is to prevent water seeping in underneath the, uh, underneath the apron and eroding away the foundations. Well, eroding away the foundations, and I imagine nobody wants that. I'd imagine there's other problems here for undermining and piping. And from where I stand, I imagine if the pipes aren't connected together, I mean, that's going to be a problem as well. That's right, Peter. In practice, piping is also caused by pipes coming apart and box culvert units coming apart underneath the embankment. In practice, we uh, make these joints with rubber O-rings. If they aren't installed properly during construction, they can leak later on, and that can cause leakage of water from the pipe into the bedding and also then lead to this piping problem again. It's important installing the O-ring to make sure that it's uniformly placed around the spigot before the spigot is then pushed in gently and, and uniformly so that we get a good watertight seal. Have a look at this, Peter. Right. Just on our way to the trench, but I thought I'd show you this. This is what we call an O-ring, and you can see some just oh, sitting there. Have a look at this, folks, an O-ring in the wild. That's right. So basically, we're looking at the, the spigot end of the pipe. Right. And the socket end, where it flares out, is your, is your socket end. Socket end. That's and right. That's the spigot, spigot end. end. So the O-ring is installed on the, on the spigot end. Yep. And basically what that does, it makes it watertight. So no water can get through the, the socket and into the pipe. And that's all you need, just a, the big O. That's right, but you've got to install it properly. Right. Sometimes this slips off that way and water can get in. Other times it comes on here like oh, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, After yeah, yeah. a while it just comes off. That's no good. So you've got to make sure that that's inserted properly. So all you need to keep it waterproof is the big O put on properly. That's right. Thanks for pointing that out, Roy. So that's something to, to watch out for during construction. Every pipe needs to be mated properly with its neighbour. Also, of course, any pipes with cracked or broken spigots or sockets need to be rejected before they're installed. But I noticed when we were out on site, the workforce took a lot of attention to the weather. Absolutely. Weather is one of the things we worry about a lot. And it's important that in each individual element of drainage construction is completed in the shortest practicable time. But having said that, the quality of the work should not be jeopardised as a result of trying to get it done quickly. Yeah, don't rush it. Don't rush it. And Dennis, we're not just talking about pipes and box culverts. No, it's about all aspects of including temporary head walls and associated pits and of course even open drains. Because we want to minimise the project's exposure to adverse weather conditions and adverse environmental outcomes such as erosion or sediment runoff uh, in the event when we get heavy rainfall. Well, I think what we saw out on site earlier is a good example of how to minimise those risks. And what we see here are some pictures of what can go wrong. Incomplete drainage systems like we've seen on these photos substantially increase the risk of unacceptable erosion and sedimentation outcomes. OK, but the reality is on, on, on projects you're going to experience bad weather. Dennis, is there anything we can do to minimise the damage? Well, one thing we should do is to ensure that the drainage is installed uphill, that is from the outlet of the culvert to the inlet of the culvert, in order to minimise the risk of damage, and that's what we saw out on site. These jumping jack compactors, they're cute, aren't they? But they seem rather small for this huge site. Yeah, they do seem a bit small, but, um, and that's, but we do use these small equipment type uh, whacker packers to compact around pipes because the main aim of the game is not to damage the pipe. And if we were to use big equipment like big uh, rollers, there's a real risk of the pipe being damaged until the point in time when we get enough, uh, enough material over the top of the pipe that we can use bigger equipment. Makes sense. And what we saw there, and an important thing, is we're compacting the fill and not the pipe. And that's an important distinction. And that's why we use small compactors. And it's not until we get a decent layer of fill material over the top of the pipe that we can begin to use heavier compaction equipment. 